Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My dear friends, students of the first year, Cairo Higher Institute's English Division, it's my pleasure to invite you today to another drama lecture. Today, inshallah, we are going to discuss one of the character portrayals to start with, and then we have another group of portrayals under the title Character Portrayal. Okay? We are going to continue what we started with while talking about T.S. Eliot's famous play Murder in the Cathedral. What is the meaning of character portrayal? A character portrayal, simply speaking, needs me to understand two aspects, two elements. The first, what is meant by a character? And we said that a character is a person in drama. What is the meaning of portrayal? It means how the dramatist draws his character. How does the dramatist build up his outline of his persons in drama? So when we talk about the character portrayal, simply speaking, we are going to answer the following question. What are the qualities the dramatist did give to his character? Question mark. In other words, how does the dramatist portray, dramatize his character? The first character we have is the character of Pickett, of course. Thomas Pickett, Sir Thomas Pickett, is the hero of our play, Murder in the Cathedral. How can I start talking about character portrayal? One way is to start like this. Pickett is characterized by, and then I give the quality or the characteristic. Another person may say, T.S. Eliot dramatizes Pickett as. A third person may start as follows. Sainthood, as an example, is one of the qualities given to Pickett. So there are numerous ways to start with. This is one of them. Okay, Pickett is characterized by Sainthood. Pickett's holiness is based on his rank as the Archbishop of, Can of Canterbury. From the early beginning, we have a piece of information about Sir Thomas Pickett. Okay, he is... Of course, I'm talking about the fictional Pickett. I'm not talking about the historical one. Pickett is the Archbishop of Canterbury. He is appointed at the top of the hierarchy of the cathedral. And that's why he has holiness. He is the highest spiritual authority in England. And be careful and be reminded that there is difference between a religious man and a man of religion. A religious man could be any person who follows the teachings of his religion, the rules of his religion. I can be a farmer, a carpenter, or a teacher, and I adhere to, I stick to, I follow what my religion teaches. But when I talk about a man of religion, it means that I have an administrative rank on the hierarchy of the church. So, the highness of Pickett is due to being the, Arch, the Archbishop of Canterbury. At the same time, His Holiness is recognized by the priests as the first, uh, the first priest describes him as the father in God of the poor. So, the first characteristic we have is His Sainthood or Holiness. Another example is explained by Maxwell, one of the critics, whose full entry can be found at the end of the book. According to Maxwell, Pickett's sainthood is emphasized by his struggle to self-purification. At the same time, he rejects the four tempters. Okay, I have a person who was once the chancellor of the state, who was once enjoying all forms of pleasure, all forms of temporal authority, all forms of worldly matters. All of a sudden he is appointed as the highest spiritual authority in England. In a, in, at once he decides to give up his pleasure. At once he decides to end his 
what we say life as a man and he starts his life as an archbishop this is not available to every one of us because we are tempted ourselves can tempt us in other words we may suffer from temptations from within rather than from temptations from without how can I have all forms of authority and all of a sudden I give them up how can I have all forms of pleasure and all of a sudden I give them up so it's not a, uh, an easy decision at the same time another critic Misra talks about Pickett's rejection of the ghosts of his past which appear to him in the form of the tempters at the same time he continues that Pickett's death shall fructify the life of others all in all Pickett's holiness is associated with God and the cathedral so if we talk about Pickett's sainthood Pickett's holiness his, his martyrdom is associated with the church and God and this is enough for him to give or to attain holiness another aspect or another characteristic is the submission to God what is meant by submission to God when I submit myself to God it means that I I give God full authority of my decisions I give myself totally to God to control me I trust God 100% that's why I ask God to control me to control my words to control my actions to control every detail in my life and Pickett does so he declares I give my life to the law of God above the law of man from the early beginning the main cause of conflict between Pickett and the king was that the king tried to control the church and Pickett rejected this control and that's why he gave the law of man, the law of God priority compared to the law of man he preferred God to the king he preferred the law of God to the law of man he took the side of God not the side of the king there are also his immortal words his everlasting words before the kings I submit my cause to the judgment of Rome but if you kill me I shall rise from my town to submit my cause before God's throne he was addressing the knights the knights were approaching him they are going to murder him they are going to kill him and all of a sudden he is enjoying a spiritual peace he talks to them if you are going to kill me at that moment I'm going to rise from my thumb after death and submit my cause submit myself submit my martyrdom before God's throne Pickett is martyrdom Pickett is murdered by the end of the play and from the early beginning to the moment of his martyrdom he doesn't show any kind of violence he doesn't show any kind of resistance he is peaceful all the time so peacefulness is another quality Elliot gives to Pickett he insists that he is seeking reform on condition that this reform is bloodless he doesn't want to shed blood and we have a number of examples showing this when the knights approached him and he was inside the cathedral the priests were afraid so they unpoured they closed the door of the cathedral but Pickett refused he asked the priests to open the door immediately how can he a person close the doors of the cathedral and that's why he 
asks his priests to unbar the door. Unbar the door. And he gave prompt, prompt means immediate words. And the words were immediately performed. At the same time, he tells the priests, we are not here to triumph by fighting. We are not here to be victorious by fighting. We will never fight, but we suffer. We suffer. He accepts martyrdom. He is willing to die if death is the price paid for the, full, for the fulfillment, for the achievement of his spiritual goals. What does it mean? He has spiritual targets. He has spiritual objectives which he must do. He is willing to die if his own life is the price paid. He declares death will come when, only when I'm worthy and if I'm worthy there is no danger. Why are men, why, 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 sorry, why is man afraid of death? Because man is unworthy. Because man is afraid of danger. Because man is afraid of hell. But in our case, when we talk about Pickett, he believes that he submits himself totally to, to, to God. So if God has chosen a particular moment for Pickett's death, it means that at that moment, God declares that Pickett is worthy. And if God declares that Pickett is worthy, then Pickett is in no danger. At the same time, he courageously, with courage, he declares before the knights, For my Lord, I am now ready to die. Are you ready to die? Am I ready to die? It's very difficult to prepare yourself for death. But Pickett is ready to die. That his church may have peace and liberty. He is church. The H is capital. It means God, God church. And the C is capital. I'm not talking about the building of the church, but I'm talking about the establishment of the church. The church as an institution, the church as a system, the church as a belief, a church as the doctrine of Christianity and its manifestations. One of the main important qualities associated with Pickett is his recognition of the importance of the word. From the early beginning, he was the king's friend and chancellor. But when the king tried to control the church, Pickett rejected the king's ambition. And that's why he didn't give the king his word to pass the constitutions. He disagrees at the same time with the knights on absolving the bishops whom the Pope has suspended. When we had the conflict between the Archbishop and the King, the King had an agreement with other bishops so as to pass the Clarendon constitutions. And again, Pickett didn't fight. Pickett coordinated with the Pope and the bishops were suspended. Nobility is another quality given to Pickett. Pickett is characterized by his good behavior. He doesn't show any kind of misbehavior. All the time he is kind, all the time he is peaceful, all the time he is willing to help the others. Nobility is an aspect of good manners associated with Pickett. He refuses to betray the king, especially when he started talking with the, the third tempter. No one shall say, I betrayed the king. Even if there is a kind of hostility between the king and Pickett. Pickett and king are no longer friends, but it doesn't mean that Pickett may show any form or any aspect of betrayal. He refuses the concept. He refuses that he may be described as a person who betrayed the king. Another quality is kindness. Especially when I have kindness as a result of the previous qualities. How can a man has all the previous characteristics and be unkind? This is impossible. Or let me say this is very difficult. So, 
the man who attains all the previous qualities must be kind. Okay, how can you recognize Pickett's kindness? You have an example from outside the church. The contemporary women who reveal from the early beginning, from the intro through the introduction to the play that he is kind to his people. So according to the, to the women, Pickett is kind to the people. Okay, and you have another instance, another example from within the church, from inside the church. The words spoken by the second priest when he described Pickett as a good archbishop and he used this adjective good. The hero's description of the people who are lining the road and throwing down their caps to welcome Pickett upon his arrival to England is another evidence, is another illustration, is another example. I have an archbishop who has, be, who has spent seven years in France in exile. Now the archbishop is coming. The people are lining to welcome him. It means that he has popularity, he is popular among his people, and the people <coughs> cannot be touched unless Pickett is kind. So, from the early beginning, I have a number of qualities associated with Pickett, like sainthood, submission to God, peacefulness, acceptance of martyrdom, recognition of the importance of the world, nobility, and kindness. These qualities belong to the good character. Who is Thomas Pickett as dramatized by T.S. Eliot in Murder in the Cathedral? Okay. On the contrary, let's have a look at the other side. Those who are not kind, those who are not peaceful, those who are not vulgar, those who are not enjoying popularity. And I think the best example is the characters of the four tempters. I have here two possibilities. I have the four tempters and I have the four knives. Okay? Sometimes you have vicious aspects bad aspects, bad qualities, or something despicable. So unlike the virtuous qualities associated with Pickett, vicious aspects dominate the character portrayal of the four of the four knights. So the characters of the four knights, we have the four knights who approached the church to murder Pickett. We have the four knights who tried to fulfill the king's wish. They hear the king saying some words expressing his annoyance with Pickett. And that's why they decided to help the king according to, do, according to their view to get rid of Pickett. So unlike the virtuous qualities, unlike the good qualities associated with Pickett, vicious, bad, evil aspects. You have vicious here means evil aspects. Dominate the character portrayal of the four knights. They are dramatized as, as political thugs who speak a common sense prose to justify the murder. Okay, when do the knights appear in the final act? Okay, we have their speech by the end of the play when they were trying to justify their murder. They were trying to persuade their listeners that they didn't mean to harm Pickett. But throughout the play, when we trace the qualities Eliot gave to the four knights, the first quality we can notice is blind loyalty to the king. The knights have no persuasion. The knights have nothing to do as they have insisted on just one mission, to kill Pickett, to get rid of Pickett, to bring Pickett's life to an end. This is their mission. And their mission shows that they are 
loyal to the king, but they show blind loyalty. They, then, they, they, they don't uh, use their intellect to understand what's going on. The knights show blind loyalty to their king. Immediately after the first appearance, after their first appearance, they repeat that they have come from France because they have urgent business, something that must be achieved quickly from the king and by the king's order. The repetition of the king gives them a kind of authority. They feel that because they have order from the king, it means that they are going to fulfill it with no problem. No one is going to resist them. No one is going to stand in between. Again, and in response to picket inquiries about whom they are loyal, they repeat not just once, not twice, but thrice. They repeat three times that they are loyal to the king. For them, the king is the most important authority, whom they must show loyalty. For them, showing loyalty means achieving the king's wishes, which one of them was to get rid of Pickett. When you are showing blind loyalty, it means that you are irrational and you are aggressive. What does the meaning of irrational? You don't use your mind. When you use your mind, you are rational, you are reasonable. But when you are showing no kind of rationality, you are irrational and aggressive and vulgar. How can you allow yourself to come into the church in a very vulgar way? How can you allow yourself to murder the archbishop inside the cathedral? So this needs a higher degree of vulgarity, especially that it is not just vulgarity, it is aggression. They are aggressive. Who are totally preoccupied with murdering Pickett, regardless of his presence inside the sanctuary of the, of the cathedral. The cathedral is a religious place, so it must be respected. But they do not respect the church. They do not respect the cathedral. They do not respect it as the highest spiritual place in England at the time. So they put all these aspects of showing respect aside. That's why the priest described them as inhumane maddened beasts with the souls of them men. When you have no mind, when you are aggressive, when you are showing no respect to anyone, to any place, it means that you are no longer a human being. You act as animals and not even animals, wild animals and not even wild animals, beasts. The knight's attitude is also an example of fanaticism in the sense that Henry is not presented as giving them a command to murder Pickett. If you are going to read the play from the from cover to cover, from the end, from, from the beginning to the end, there is no one single word that tells you that they came according to the king's order because the king's order is not written, is not found. T. S. Eliot doesn't portray the king. He doesn't give the king's speeches. So the knights say that they came to fulfill the king's wish and by the king's and to fulfill the king's order. But no one is sure that the king gave such an order. However, the knights are willing to fulfill the king's supposed wish, supposed wish, which is to get rid of Pickett. Who are the knights? Who are the knights? 
The knights do not assume ordinary names. We don't have a name. We don't have a name like Thomas Pickett. We don't have a name like King Henry II. But we don't have name. They are abstract characters. Because they are not persons. They are first a gang and then a set of attitudes. They show attitude. They tell us something about how they will justify the murder of Pickett. They violate, they break the church's order and assassinate and murder Pickett inside it at first. Okay, now if you are one of these knights, you had a duty, you had a mission, which is to get rid of Pickett. You murdered Pickett. Why do you justify your murder? The play could have ended at the moment Pickett is murdered. In other words, his martyrdom, his death could have been the final point, the final word. But he justified, he justified the horrible deed. Why do we have this kind of justification? At the same time, I have a description of the knights as a gang. And they are vulgar. They insult and mock picket, not to be answered with properly and cool intelligence. Again, I have two opposites. The kind, noble, and highly spiritual archbishop versus the vulgar, violent, and aggressive Knights. So, after comparing these two sets of characters, we have Pickett on one side and the Knights on the other side, we come to know how T.S. Eliot managed to portray the good character who dies for a cause and the vulgar character who achieve a certain goal that is not based, that is unpaced. For the time being, I hope that each character is given some kind of detail, although there are lots of details to be said so far, Pickett is concerned as well as the four knights, but these are just snapshots these are just selected points representing the character portrayal of Thomas Pickett on the one hand and the Four Knights on the other hand. I hope you have enjoyed today's lecture. Till I meet you once again, I wish you all the best and thank you.